Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, <clears throat> I do apologize for the uh, delay in um, <clears throat> in the presentation and starting the presentation. There were a few technical details and I am a little bit ill, so I do apologize for that. Inshallah, without further ado, we're going to start, inshallah, the presentation. I have a number of slides uh, I want to share, uh, inshallah, uh, as usual. The title of the talk is um, Architecture and the Luminous Ground. Um, I chose the topic because I think it's uh, one of the greatest gifts we can do uh, and gi give to the world uh, and give to ourselves is to recover the spiritual foundations of every aspect of our lives, including uh, the, the built environment and the spaces that we live in and the spaces that we, that we build around us. Uh, it may not be intuitively uh, and immediately obvious to, to many to choose a topic like architecture in a holy month like Ramadan, but hopefully, inshallah, by the end of this presentation, or at least by the end of the four presentations, inshallah, uh, I will have you convinced that it is extremely, extremely important. So let's uh, start. I'd like you to start first um, by considering a number of, uh, of experiences you may have had. It may be standing on a beach, uh, ankle deep in water, waves gently lapping against your feet, uh, the sun setting behind a crimson horizon, or looking up at the immense blazing stars, the sight of a mountain engulfed in mist, or a rock overgrown with moss. In each and every one of these experiences that we have in nature, there is a remarkable experience that we have, a quality that we perceive, but we can't really always articulate. What is it that eludes conceptualization, but is somehow tangibly intangible or intangibly tangible at the same time? It is basically life. Uh, life, not in the crude sense of uh, life in terms of uh, my, uh, my own life or uh, my career life, but life in its most pristine and fundamental form. In the language of philosophy, philosophers tend to refer to it as, as being uh, or existence um, in its very raw and naked form. It's utterly simple, it's truthful, it's beautiful, and it's glorious. In some religious traditions, they call it the Tao. It's the principle that flows through all things. In some uh, traditions in Islam, it is referred to as the breath of the compassionate one, Nafas al-Rahman, uh, that breath that God, out of his sheer generosity, grants to uh, all living things, or to all things in existence. Everything by virtue of existing exists because of divine compassion in the form of a breath that God uh, breathes out, as it were, metaphorically speaking, and breathes into uh, all existing uh, things. So once they existed in darkness or they had no existence, they abided in darkness, and then they were given light, they were given existence, and this is the breath of the compassion. It is one, yet many. It is manifest, yet hidden, or hidden, yet very manifest at the same time. It's something that we see, it's something that we perceive, it's something that we know is there everywhere around us, but somehow it loses our grasp. We feel it, we know it, we encounter it, uh, but often we flee away from it uh, with our overly abstract concepts and ideas. It's tangible, yet intangible. It's tangible in the sense that we feel it, we know it, we see it everywhere. In, the, in a waterfall, in a tree, in a plant, uh, in a river, in a mountain. Yet at the same time, we know that that's not all there is to it. That somehow there is an excess to this life that we feel around us that is beyond our immediate grasp. And, the, and hence it is uh, intangible in that sense. And 
this notion of life is a very, uh, a very interesting, very profound one, at least in the Islamic tradition. Our contemporary cosmology would suggest to us that uh, life is restricted to uh, animals or human beings, or somehow uh, even extended to the, the life of animals uh, and plants, sorry. Um, but increasingly with our new physics, uh, increasingly with our new awareness of the complexity of life and, and the world around us, we increasingly uh, in our contemporary thought increasingly recovering an ancient idea that life extends beyond just the narrow definition uh, that we give to animal life or human life. Life is something, uh, a quality that is possessed by all things, by the virtue of existing. And of course, in the Islamic tradition, in Islamic cosmology and Islamic theological understandings of the divine names, we know that uh, everything is alive simply because we know that the living one, Al-Hay, is one of the most supreme divine names. It's one. It's the top of the hierarchy of the Ummahat al-Asma. In Islamic cosmology, Ummahat al-Asma are the divine names that grant uh, existence, or the divine names that God bestows upon, uh, or through which God uh, creates, and then for bestows these same attributes upon created things. Life is the most general, the most all-encompassing of the divine names that you see before you on the screen, because everything, before it possesses knowledge, before it possesses speech, uh, before it possesses, possesses a will, or power, hearing, or seeing, requires this fundamental quality called life. Everything in the heavens and on the earth glorifies God. We know this through the Quran. We also know through the example of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that the pebbles uh, performed the speech of Allah SWT in his hands, that mountains shook beneath his feet, that camels and plants performed their prayers and could speak. And so everything is very much alive. In fact, everything that issues forth from Al Hay is uh, alive, whether it's a stone, whether it's a tree, whether it's a mountain or whether it's a plant. So in the Islamic uh, tradition, the Islamic understanding of things, everything from the smallest thing in creation to the largest galaxies and super galaxies, everything is very much alive. Everything falls under the all encompassing divine name, al Hay. Life is the most pervasive quality that permeates uh, all, all things. And so in many ways, then we, we can say that a pebble possesses a degree of life a tree possesses degrees of life, a mountain possesses degrees of life, and so do plants, each in different degrees. And one might say that what distinguishes the human being is the degree uh, or intensity of life that we possess uh, more than any uh, of the other creatures. And so everything is alive. The name, the living one, is an essential name of God. Nothing can emerge from him but living things. Hence, all of the cosmos is alive. For indeed, the non-existence of life or the existence in the cosmos of an existent thing that is not alive has no divine support. Whereas every contingent thing must have a support. And so what you consider to be inanimate is in fact uh, alive. We didn't need recent physics to tell us, to tell us that stones uh, have a certain degree of life. The Quran, the Quran has already told us this. The Quran has already told us that the minerals uh, are very much alive. And so life or the existence uh, or the cosmos really consists of a cascade of living beings who issue forth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who are constantly and perpetually returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is very much uh, alive in that sense. And so we can say that then that life is an objective quality. Uh, of things in the world. When we look at a stone, for example, we cannot say the stone is inanimate. Uh, the stone is not alive. What we can say and should say is uh, a stone is very much alive with a certain degree of life. Um, and this degree of life is something objective, something we observe. If we separate, if we isolate for uh, for an exercise purpose, 
our contemporary cosmology and our contemporary understanding of, of things. And if we just really truly focus on uh, a wave breaking on a shore or that stone that parts of the flowing waters in a stream or a branch of a tree swaying in the wind, a meadow of flowers, or even this rock in, the, in this meadow here before you in this picture. If we really focus uh, and connect with our heart, we can see that each one of these is pulsating with a certain degree uh, of life. And, and the measure of life is not necessarily uh, known or recognized by the degree of movement. It may be easier to see life in a flowing stream or in the movement of a branch in the, in the wind. But if we are honest with ourselves and we look carefully, uh, even this large boulder or this stone in the picture uh, seems very much uh, alive. It somehow enlivens us in the process. And so life itself is an objective quality uh, in things, uh, in the world that we perceive uh, on a regular basis. <clears throat> and where there is life, there is beauty. There is indeed a primordial recognition of an objective beauty that lies deep within all things, as opposed to a subjective beauty. In contemporary culture, we're con constantly told that beauty is in the uh, eye of the beholder. Uh, this is a very false uh, understanding of the statement itself, but it does say one uh, thing that is true, and that is, there's a certain kind of beauty that is subjective. It is time bound, it is relative to sociocultural and personal taste. Some people may prefer certain colors. Some people may prefer certain kinds of dress. Some people may have preferences for particular types of food. Um, at a collective level, certain cultures may have preferences for certain kinds of colors or certain kind of designs. And these are all, well, they're socially culturally bound definitions of what is beautiful. But this is not the only type of beauty that exists. There is also an objective type of beauty. And that is the beauty that is eternal and universal. It's the kind that we find in nature. It's the kind that heals us and completes us because it flows directly from the fount of life and courses through all things. It's not a matter of culture. It's not a matter of nation or individual subjectivity to decide on it. It elicits the same deep movement of the soul and triggers the same train of meditation in every human being. Though it is objective, it is nonetheless experienced subjectively and differently according to each individual. And one of the most amazing things about most pre-modern cultures, in fact, all pre-modern cultures, is that they privileged objective beauty they privilege objective beauty because it was beauty designed um, by the paradigm of uh, the divine scheme of things. Objective beauty of nature cannot be surpassed. It's perfect because it was uh, designed, created, ordered and patterned according to a divine paradigm. And so it is this type of beauty that people aspire to. And so when pre-modern cultures decided to uh, develop frameworks and parameters and conditions and criteria for producing things in the world, like architecture, like towns, like cities, or even like uh, pots and pans and chairs, they decided that the only type of standards of beauty worth emulating were those found in nature. Because it is the uh, standard of perfection because it is divine creation. It is only our contemporary cultures since the 19th and 20th century that seems to have shifted its attention away from the objective beauty of nature in order to focus on the laws, parameters, and criteria of subjective beauty. The problem with subjective beauty is some people may like it, some people may not. If it doesn't have an objective standard, like the parameters and uh, conditions and characteristics of beauty of nature, it won't receive universal uh, approval. And subjective beauty, one of the major problems with it is 
it is too immersed in one's individual whims and the desires of the ego and its uh, incidental preferences. And so if, I, if my preferences and my taste happen to overlap with that of a particular individual, I, I may like the kind of art they produce and the kind of architecture they produce. But if it does not overlap with it, I'm certainly not going to find it beautiful. The chaos of our modern cities, the chaos of our modern art is that rather than take the objective standards of beauty found in nature as the ideal to emulate, it has taken the subjective whims of the ego as the ideals uh, to emulate. <clears throat> and uh, later, inshallah, in the next few talks, we're going to have occasion to talk about this and come back to this topic again and again. But this objective beauty in nature is something that we all uh, understand. It's a universal truth. Many of us find ourselves wandering into uh, these pathways in nature, escaping the anxiety and alienation that our modern cities bring us and the lifestyle that it brings to us. In the bosom of nature, we escape from our worries, from our woes and find refuge in God's creation. We find refuge in the patterned beauty and ordered behavior of the natural world. <clears throat> in all cultures and civilizations throughout human history, nature has always been considered sacred, uh, holy and beautiful. <clears throat> you won't find a single person who will tell you that the beauty of nature um, is, is contested. And you won't find a single person who will dispute the healing power uh, of nature herself. Unless someone, of course, who has been traumatized uh, by something uh, in the natural world. Um, so for example, uh, someone who has experienced some trauma in the forest may not like to visit the forest after that because of a personal trauma. But that personal trauma is incidental. The fitra beneath that trauma is naturally inclined to uh, love the beauty of nature. <clears throat> so individual traumas don't um, mis disprove the point, but rather <clears throat> they prove the point itself. Unless you find someone who has been uh, psychologically disturbed by a natural phenomenon, the natural human situation, natural human condition is always to find comfort in the natural world. Therefore, objective beauty is an undeniable truth rooted in our fitrah, rooted in our universal nature. There are therefore universal, constant, immutable patterns of being, or sunnatullah fit halq. There are patterns of order in the natural world and in creation. There are uh, ways of being. There are ways in which things are interconnected which is the Quran refers to as sunnah to life and halq, that are universally acceptable, that are universally uh, um, desirable, that are universally uh, pursued and sought out, out for their comfort and for their uh, intrinsic uh, peace and harmony that they bring us. <clears throat> In the natural world, in life, as it courses through the natural things that Allah Taala has created in the world, we find life in its most pristine form. It is upon the original fitra. Whereas human beings may corrupt their own fitra, whereas we may produce cities that are ugly, the natural order is always pristine. The natural order is always upon the fitra or the pattern behavior and disposition that God has created for it. At once whole and holy, nature nourishes, it enlivens, it heals. In our age of alienation, of course, we turn to nature to find ourselves, to restore our fitra. There's something remarkable that happens to us, which I'll be talking about a lot more in the next few weeks, when we come into contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Sunnah fil khalq. Whenever we encounter something that Allah Taala has created, whenever we encounter something that is upon its own fitra, its own nature, 
like the natural world, even if we are not upon our own nature, even if we are somehow misaligned or imbalanced, the mere encounter with a fitraic reality like nature immediately reconfigures us and realigns us and restores that balance, though temporarily. So when we go through that forest walk, we walk on a beach. What happens temporarily, one of the most profound reasons why we find such comfort in places like this is that at a very unconscious level, deep within our very being, things are shifting and morphing, changing and transforming, realigning themselves with the pattern of behavior of the waves, the pattern of behavior of the trees in the forest. Yet when we come back to our uh, cities and towns, what tends to happen is that temporary realignment and balance that happened in our nature walk or on that beach is disturbed once again because of the unnatural rhythms and patterns of behavior of our everyday life. To be near anything with life is to be whole. In the presence of life, the mind is still. There are no thoughts, just one's entire being face to face with all that is. It occurs most deeply when things simply are, when we experience that which is, when we feel where we are immersed in the current moment, as opposed to preoccupied with things that we performed in the past or worrying about things that have yet to come in the future. The Muslim is someone who is Ibn al-Waqt, the son and daughter of the present moment. Why? Because in the present moment, we are able to be present to the divine presence. And ultimately, that is the goal of our entire existence, is to be perpetually connected to the fundamental reality of what is, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, the ground of all being, the one who has granted to all creatures and to all creation its form, its life, its sustenance, al hayyul qayyum And in this river of life, in the presence of al hay in the presence of the divine presence, in the present moment, duality is overcome. If in our everyday consciousness, what we might call rafla or forgetfulness, there is a subject standing over and against an object out there in the world, an I and an it, in the internal consciousness of remembrance or dhikr, in the present moment of being present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wholeness is unveiled or revealed to us, or the fundamental reality that all is one. And there is neither I nor it, for both have evaporated as the phantoms that they really are. What is left is the reality, al haqq What remains when all that is illusory fades away is nothing but the face of God. Kullu shay'in halikun illa wajhullah, a wajhu. Everything is or will be annihilated except the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because ultimately, only the face of Allah is real. Everything else is contingent. Everything else is illusory. Everything else is dependent on the reality of God. This is the luminous ground we encounter in nature. Many people deny it. Many people try to not call it God call it something else but in reality as Muslims we know that this is nothing but the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sustains all of creation and all things I've chosen to describe it as a luminous ground for a very particular reason uh, a reason that will become clearer and clearer throughout these presentations inshallah but one of the uh, fundamental reasons why I want to call it luminous ground is because the term luminous refers to light. Uh, it refers to um, the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nur samawati wal ard. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a light that grants to all things existence. 
is the life that grants them existence and knowledge and bestows upon them the gift of uh, being and the gift of remembering him. However, when we tend to think often of uh, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or when we tend to think of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we tend to always think about a celestial heavenly thing. We tend to think of something uh, that's quite distant, that's quite uh, out there, over and above us somewhere in a distant realm. Um, but in reality, the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the first and the last, the outward, uh, the hidden, the, the hidden and the outward, uh, or the inward and the outward. The reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that uh, he uh, encompasses all things. His divine name and muhit means that he encompasses all things. But it also means that um, he is encountered not only in the most distant inward reality, but also in the most visible, most apparent uh, physical realities around us. One of the most amazing things about Islam is the manner in which it gives uh, the reality of appearances and the reality of the physical world such dignity. In many religious traditions, to escape, uh, to, to encounter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means to escape the physical world, to escape the material world. In Islam, the Quran describes heaven in very sensual material terms. And the physical world is described in very spiritual terms. Both the physical world and the spiritual world are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're realities that are manifested by the divine names. And so no part of existence is denigrated. No part of existence is bad or negative. All of reality around us is actually uh, nothing but the traces of the divine names, nothing but the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing but things that are underpinned by the face of God. And a lot of the poetry of the Muslim mystics like Rumi, Hafiz, uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, Ghazali, and many others, we find these wonderful descriptions of encountering the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. Wherever you turn, there is the face of God. Uh, many commentators have read this uh, verse uh, suggesting uh, that although we turn towards Mecca in our prayers in order to, to encounter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reality Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nowhere and everywhere at the same time. And so we can encounter the face of Allah, the face of God in everything. In everything he has a sign that indicates that he is one. And so in the reality, in the physical reality of the trees and the, and, the, and the pebbles and the stones and the rivers and the mountains, we can encounter the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what I mean by ground. It's, 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 the Quran suggests and it indicates and even pushes us in the direction of understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encountered everywhere in the signs of nature around us. The Quran is full of references to the physicality of things, the wind and the breeze, the mountains and the streams and the colors of fruits and plants and animals in their diversity. And so the encounter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not through a flight from the world, but is largely an encounter with the traces of the divine names in this world. And hence the term ground. By ground, we mean the very foundation upon which we stand, the earth upon which we walk. Everything is rooted in this earth. The constant references in the Quran to the heavens and the earth should always remind us that a flight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not always uh, towards the heavens, it's also always uh, or also towards the earth simultaneously. And so the luminous ground, the term luminous ground, really captures the dual meaning of both a celestial heavenly light, and also the very foundations upon which we exist in this world. I love this image of uh, this grass moss extending beyond the forest floor in order to cover uh, the trees, uh, almost um, breaking that kind of boundaries uh, and between tree and forest floor between trees and plants. The reality of existence is that 
it's all interconnected, part of one tapestry, interwoven, the warp and weft being the divine names as they interweave the tapestry of existence. And so the luminous ground then we encounter in nature, the quality that enlivens us, that brings us life, that makes us happy, that fills our soul with joy and bliss is nothing but the reality of God. An atheist may not encounter uh, uh, this reality in all its luminosity and perhaps call it God, but nonetheless, uh, every, uh, everyone, even the atheist, uh, encounters it and uh, describes nature in these, in these same terms. The Muslim, of course, knows that this reality that is encountered, this hazy reality that seems to subtend, that seems to support, that seems to um, course through all things in existence, is nothing but the reality of the divine names through his divine name, al Hay, the breath of the compassionate one that courses through all things. This is the luminous ground we are talking about. You might be thinking by now that what has all of this to do with architecture? This makes sense in relation to our nature, but how is it all related to architecture? Well, a hint. What if the quality of life and wholeness that I've been talking about just found in nature? What if this luminous ground that we encounter in nature could be extended into the world of man-made objects? What if walking through a town felt like walking through a forest? What if sitting, sitting in a chair felt like sitting on the earth? What if walking between two trees was similar to walking through, between, uh, uh, through a doorway, for example? What if the same quality, enlivening quality that we encounter in the natural world um, could be extended into the man-made world? This is how uh, I'm going to link architecture to the luminous ground, inshallah. If we consider these two images, on the left your hand, you have the field of architecture as a profession, as a discipline. And on the right hand side, you have architecture in the field. You have an empty field, uh, rolling hills. Of course, the image on the right, the field of nature is absolutely beautiful, absolutely stunning. Now the question is, if we are to, as, is our, as our amana on earth, as the khulafa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> on earth, we have an amana, the stewardship over the natural world. And so whenever we construct something, whenever we make something, whenever the field of architecture intervenes in the natural field or architecture in the field, we have to ask ourselves the following question. Unless whatever it is that we build is of equal beauty to this field, unless we're replacing this beautiful field was something equally beautiful. It's a travesty, it's a crime to build something uh, less beautiful. Otherwise, what we're doing, what the human or man-made world is doing is creating ugliness, covering over and destroying the natural beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and creating uh, ugliness in its place. But it doesn't have to be like that. I'm reminded of a comment made by one scholar once who said, not all architecture fits or is fitting to replace the great and empty fields uh, of um, our lovely countryside. But he went on to say, but if something like Cambridge, this is an image of Cambridge, of course, if the Cambridge colleges were to extend indefinitely into the English countryside, it would be a most welcome um, thing indeed. And the reason being is because you can see from the right hand side to the left hand side, increasingly as the colleges extend into the natural paddocks and, and, and empty meadows of Cambridgeshire, they add lovely, beautiful, ancient courtyards with immaculately designed gardens. Um, and so 
what is being replaced, the empty meadows that are being replaced, are being replaced by something equally beautiful, if not in some, in some instances more beautiful. So we do have the capacity to extend and create beauty equal to natural beauty. But in most instances, especially in the 20th century, we fail to do so. So the question becomes, how do we recover this capacity to create such beauty? I'm gonna try to uh, engage in a bit of a theological reflection on the root of as uh, seen kaf noon. Uh, the term exists and is mentioned several times in the Quran. And what's so remarkable about this term is it can provide perhaps a foundation for a new theology of the built environment in Islam, a new theology of dwelling. In several places in the Quran, the root seen uh, kaf noon comes in a variety of different forms. And it has a variety of different meanings to dwell, to live, uh, to find peace, to find rest, to find tranquility. In other derivations, it also has the meaning of to rest, resting place, reassurance. And also it has uh, the meaning of sakina, tranquility. It's linked to the word sakina. So if you go back a little bit, we are, Adam lives with his wife in heaven. The male and female were created for one another that they may find peace and rest with one another. And the Sakina is, uh, has the meaning, of course, of tranquility, the spirit of tranquility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to descend upon the hearts of the believers. And then we have the term Masakim, dwellings, houses, buildings, which are uh, it's peppered throughout the Quran. One might be able to derive from the root of these, um, these three trilateral root is the idea of tranquility, peace, um, dwelling. So one might say that what is, if one were asked what is the core uh, uh, objective or reason for uh, architecture in this world or man-made structures, it is to uh, dwell in tranquility and peace uh, in this world. And I will unravel more of this theology of uh, Sakana in uh, the next few lectures, inshallah. But I wanted to can just put this out there uh, at this stage because it really helped me reformulate the way in which I understand um, our human existence. If Adam in heaven is meant to dwell in paradise, the idea of existing or dwelling in heaven is one of absolute joy and tranquility. And when Allah SWT says that he created um, the, the husband and wife so that they may find sakina, they may find sakina or sukun or tranquility with one another, it suggests also that um, this root term suggests uh, a coexistence or dwelling with one another that um, is full of peace and repose. And the term Sakina and Masakin also suggest that our dwellings, our buildings, our houses are ones that are supposed to shelter a tranquil, peaceful uh, existence, both in terms of one another, families who exist with one another, both in terms of town and city and communal life, but also in terms of the relationship between human life and the earth itself. We cannot call buildings masakin if they are sources of not serenity and repose, but alienation and anxiety. And a lot of the architecture of the modern world uh, is the exact opposite of this, uh, this sukun. Now, now we come to the crux of the matter, the link between architecture and nature. 
If nature is objectively and universally beautiful and alive, can human designs be as objectively beautiful and alive as the things of nature? If you look at this wonderful bridge built across this river and the, uh, the cottage at the end of that bridge, overgrown with plants, almost like nature reclaiming the building. In many ways, one can describe the mountain in the background and the river in the foreground in the same terms as one describes the bridge and the cottage. They fit there, they belong there, they have given the natural material used and the beauty of their forms and the wonderful grace, graceful way in which the bridge and the house age and the way they kind of sprout out of the natural landscape without doing any violence to the natural order of things. They seem to be alive as, as the trees are alive and the river is alive. And so can, if we ask ourselves, can man-made objects partake in that objective beauty, the kind of beauty that is eternal and transcends the ravages of time and the limitations of taste and style, what might be inclined to say yes? Are buildings capable of healing us, connecting us, confronting us with our fitrah? The answer is yes. And only one, one only has to recall their experience with many traditional buildings and towns around the world to remember and to uh, uh, recall how they kind of heal us and connect us to something deeper in a ways that many modern buildings don't. Can we create buildings that actualize sukun, tranquility, peace, repose in God? Many people who move out into the countryside purchase old properties, traditional buildings, uh, and live in proximity to nature will say that these buildings are more conducive to a spiritual life, more conducive to being closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the concrete jungles of our modern cities. And there's a reason why. It's because the buildings are almost living artifacts. They're alive, uh, sharing in the kind of life and beauty that we find in the natural world. Whether it's the bridge, centuries old bridge that cross the stream without doing violence to the banks of the river itself, by deploying and using natural materials and a gentle arch over the river, or whether it's the layers and layers of different kinds of material sourced from local quarries around the area, reflecting the, um, the palette, the texture, the color of the region itself. Many of these buildings do indeed actualize a certain degree of sukun. In fact, if we were to draw sukun in architectural forms and terms, it will probably be one of these arches of the bridge or one of the arches of that building there, sitting there in repose, peacefully, fully balanced. <clears throat> Traveling through any of the traditional towns built in the past, one comes across a quality, almost like a reverie, a dream, or a nostalgia. In fact, the very term nostalgia, nostros, suggests that uh, it's a journey of homecoming. One has a nostalgia for home because one uh, pines for that which he or she has lost. And so when we walk, stroll down one of these Cotswold villages in the English countryside, we often feel like we've come home, even though we may be visiting the place for the first time. <clears throat> and the reason being is because it connects us to something deeper, something that is soulful. Whether it's the Cotswold or the hilltop towns of Tuscany or any one of the beautiful uh, streets in Rome or the beehive city of Fez, one feels like one is at the center of something very profound. Uh, <clears throat> one is entering into uh, an entirely different world from the world of our modern cities. That explains partly why we flock to these traditional townscapes. It also explains why we find these places warm, soulful, and whole. It's indeed because we have arrived home. 
I remember many of my own travels around many traditional cities and towns around the world. Wherever I, I traveled to, as long as it was a traditional city built in harmony with nature, as most traditional cities were, and villages, I felt like I was home, even if I were visiting the place for the first time. That speaks volumes for the kind of alienation we have for our modern cities. We can live in the same place in a large concrete jungle for decades and not feel at home, and yet visit the countryside once or a old village and immediately feel like we've arrived home. To have the same effect as nature, man-made objects must be pulsating with the same degree of life found in nature. Visiting a traditional town or sitting in a Quaker chair, one comes away with a feeling that one has been deeply moved and touched by something profound. Consider the cobbled streets of Siena on the right with those beautiful arches and the uh, several centuries of different kinds of materials all quarried from the soil of Siena herself. Outside the city, the soil of the Tuscan countryside or immediately around Siena gives that color to the bricks used in the buildings. One can describe them as living somehow. They ooze a quality that is timeless, that somehow brings us closer to the nature of things. One of the most amazing things about natural material, which we'll talk about in the next lecture, is that they age with grace. They age by showing duration, by showing time, by showing the millions of years of the rock's formation. And in the very instance in which we perceive and encounter these, these types of materials, we immediately come in touch with the antiquity of the earth itself. We come into touch and in contact with something very profound, <clears throat> very ancient. That's why I refer to them as living artifacts. And they're living and alive and natural, not only because they resemble things in nature. If you look at these lower two images, these are the mukarnas used in Islamic architecture quite extensively. They look like stalactites that you find in caves or a beehive in their structure. Of course, anything, all traditional architecture seems to resemble the natural world. Uh, because, as I said earlier, before the modern period, architects and artists always looked to nature for emulation. And they derived the principles for doing great architecture from the very principles and patterns and order found in nature, which is Sunnat al al Hulk. By extracting Sunnat al al Hulk, by extracting these uh, proportions, this harmony found in the natural world, they believed that they could create similar type of beauty in their own objects. And so indeed, we find the resemblances, not only in their portion and harmony, but also sometimes in the form itself. Looking at this horseshoe arch in the great mosque, Cordoba, for example, one cannot help but feel like one is looking at a living thing, complete, balanced, perfect, centered, or the Mukarnas dome on the right-hand side in the Alhamara, as it unfolds from a center. Some scholars have described this pattern as the uh, blossoming of the breath of the compassionate one, as it opens up. So at the very center is a darkness of non-existence. And from there, creation opens up like a flower. The breath of the compassionate one opens up into and becomes creation, the created world. And seeing this in person, one feels a dynamic movement of the flower or the breath as it unfolds. And one feels very much in the presence of a cosmic mystery at the very center of being itself, 
the moment before creation as it unfolds. Or this Quaker chair, there's something quite lively, not only because it is handmade, not only because there are imperfections in it, because of course, in, at least in the Islamic tradition, the imperfections of things are part of their perfections, but also because of the natural material. It has a certain serenity about it, a certain repose that many modern industrial chairs simply do not have. The natural material used in the chair, of course, does suggest that it is an extension of nature into the man-made world. But not only that, not only that its subtle harmonious forms, simplicity, and its unpretentious nature, it just is. The city of Fez, of course, with its beehive-like courtyards, seems like an organic mass naturally generated out of the landscape itself. Any outsider who comes into the city not familiar with its organic form and structure and the manner in which it gradually grew out of a center may get lost in the city. But it does have an order, it does have a rhythm. But it's the rhythm of nature. It's not the rhythm of straight lines. It's not downtown Manhattan with its first street and second street and third street. Monotonous repetition of the same. The kind of repetitions we find in nature are not the same, or identical. The repetitions of the similar. Two, no two leaves are the same or identical, yet they are very similar. The kind of repetition we find in nature is not monotonous, but rather enriching. No two snowflakes are the same either, yet the code that generates the growth of a snowflake is identical in each case. So the kind of diversity we find in the natural world is the kind of diversity that we find most appealing and the kind of diversity we find peace in. And that's the kind of diversity that you find in the growth of many traditional towns. Or if we look on the right-hand side, this wonderful Black Forest hut overlooking the German countryside, the Black Forest, sits there almost as if it had sprouted out of the landscape. All traditional townscapes, all traditional buildings, all traditional craftworks have the quality of a living thing. Of course, there are exceptions. There are many designs from the past that don't fit this bill. Not every building built in the past and not every city designed uh, were designed according to these same principles. But by and large, the majority of towns, villages, and things produced do have this quality. And if you look at any one of these objects, if it is beautiful, then it has achieved the quality of wholeness that is found in nature and is very much alive. <clears throat> this town here in Southern Morocco looks like it was generated from the landscape itself. The mud brick material used is sourced locally. Architectural forms rise into the sky. The pattern and color fit in with the landscape. A beautiful building full of life may be defined as one that reposes peacefully where it is and instills such repose within whoever perceives it. This is what a very famous author, John Ruskin, calls living architecture. It is whole and holy. Goethe, the German poet, calls it life enhancing. So there are human artifacts that we can call living. Not only are they alive, but they are life enhancing because in the presence of them, we feel more alive. They heal because there is sensation in every inch of them. A determined variation in arrangement, such as we find in the related proportions and the structure of organic forms. There's a profound similarity between the beauty of traditional buildings, most traditional buildings, and the beauty and proportions and the structure of organic forms that we find in nature. Traditional buildings then and craftswork have this timeless, even numinous quality, the quality of being alive. Though man-made, they feel organic, as though nature herself had produced them. <clears throat> they were molded into their present form over long periods. Think of the 
this street here in a small village in England. Each one of these buildings was molded into their present form over long periods of time, which despite the upheavals of cultural diversity, they all possess a shared vision and a common set of values. It is true that the act of making is a result of ad hoc acts of construction and production over long periods of time. But despite these intermittent acts of incremental making and refining, they sit side by side over the centuries with an extraordinary level of coherence. One of the most amazing things about traditional cities is though they were designed and built through ad hoc acts of construction over centuries and centuries and centuries, they maintain a certain degree of coherence about them because they are underpinned by a principle that is very similar throughout the ages, shared by all those who built them. And that is that they emulate the principles of nature herself. Most modern cities don't have this quality because modern, most modern architects do not follow the pattern of nature, but they follow the whims of their own egos and their own desires. And so each building stands out as a stark contrast, contrast to the next one and the next one and the next one. Whereas this traditional village here, for example, taken together, they form an ecosystem of living things that could not be other than they, what they are and where they are, much like any unique ecosystem of trees, stones, birds, plants, and insects cannot be what they are in that particular place. <clears throat> and I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that an empty plot of land um, is beautified by the extension of buildings like this upon it. That these kind of structures ennoble the field, the empty field, rather than destroy it. Though man made this traditional hilltop town in Italy feels organic as though nature herself had produced it, <clears throat> it grows out of the rocky outcrop because it draws on the same material and the same principles that govern the growth of the rocks themselves. Observe the effect that these objects have on us. If each and every one of you just recalls strolling through an, a beautiful old street in Istanbul <clears throat> or the old back street of Damascus or many of the traditional villages and towns around the world, one feels that they evince a deep feeling, an echo of our very soul a mirror of our deepest self, and they rouse in us certain trains of meditation in the mind. But Anabi once beautiful said, certain places have an effect and leave traces in sensitive hearts. And that is indeed true. Places have an effect on our hearts. And so the more the place is in tune with the nature of things, the more the place is in harmony with the natural order, the more it instills within us the same pattern, the same natural harmony. In the midst of this atmospheric embrace of these living artifacts, it is easy to lose all track of time. In a traditional town, nature and artifice are in collusion here, and the effect is magical, mysterious, and sacred. Almost a mirror of our fitra. In fact, according to traditional understandings of architecture, architecture art, all man-made artifacts are supposed to mirror our fitra. They're supposed to be designed according to patterns and proportions of harmony found in the natural order. So that when we walk through the streets of these towns, when we use the objects, they act as mirrors of our fitra, mirrors of perfections, mirrors of proportional ideals that we aspire to become and embody in our day-to-day -day lives. When we walk through a traditional town, its natural proportions, its natural harmony, reconfigure our very existence, reconfigure our constitution, and align us with the natural proportions and harmony that they embody, thereby calling us back to our natural self, to our fitra. Indeed, it is the same quality of life that animates the beauty of nature and the beauty of traditional craftworks a unity of feeling evinced by an overall uh, harmony across both. Once the quality of life is achieved in these man-made objects, they attain an intensity of being that is boundless. One can imagine 
the things of this world as a spider web of a network of nodes, as it were, or knots. Everything being a node or not, and the they're connected by a thread to another node or another knot. Now, the more our objects and artifacts possess this degree of life in them, the more they uh, emulate the beauty and life found in nature, the more intense they become as nodes that grant access to uh, being itself or to the luminous ground. The word artifacts no longer really captures the true meaning. They are best described as living things. Look at this image on the right-hand side, for example. It's the north portal entrance to a, a mosque, Selçuk Mosque in Turkey. All living structures glow with a luminous quality. One has the feeling that one is gazing at something beyond the configuration of the physical qualities of the object. One, in a sense, feels that one is in contact with what is beyond the merely physical, that somehow one has entered a portal into the metaphysical. These portals, these nodes, become intense degrees, intense moments of light through which we penetrate beyond the merely physical. They are webs of meaning and values that are multi-layered and afford never repeatable rich ex existential experiences. They are nodes of light that shine brightest in the darkness of our existence. Founts of a divine presence that cascades down through all of creation. We're looking at this North Portal entrance once again. One feels like the very materiality, as it were, of the stone itself has been transformed, intensified, and the intrinsic life that pulsates through all things somehow made visible, made palpable, made tangible. The portal to the mosque then becomes a portal into <coughs> the luminous ground itself. What is felt is not a visual quality, but that which is always behind it, the face of God in things, the luminous ground. <coughs> so yes, once again, in architecture, we can find the luminous ground. We can encounter the face of God in things <coughs> because so long as man-made world becomes an extension of the perfection and beauty, harmony, proportion, and order found in nature, then it can uh, achieve the same kind of effects as the natural world. In later weeks, inshallah, I'll be talking about uh, the creativity of the artist and the extent to which uh, the artist and the architect are able to infuse their works with uh, certain qualities that Allah SWT has uniquely granted to human beings. <coughs> so in the next three weeks, inshallah, next few talks, I'm going to be talking about um, a number of things. Let me break it down in the following way. For those of you not familiar with Aristotle's notion of four causes, Aristotle says that everything in existence must have four causes. Everything has, has four causes. Um, and this is uh, something that has been uh, also articulated within Islamic thought itself. So if we think of a dining table, for example, the first cause of a dining table is its material cause, i.e. the wood. So that's the first cause, the material cause, the thing that the, the table is made of. The formal cause is the form it takes, <coughs> the shape it takes at the very end. <coughs> that's the formal cause or design. And then it has an efficient cause. The efficient cause is the carpentry or the carpenter himself as he works through with his tools in order to create the table. And the final cause of course is dining. The reason why we have a dining table is to enjoy the experience of dining. Likewise, if we use the same analogy for architecture, we can say that architecture has also four causes. There is the material cause, the material out of which a building is built. There is the formal cause, the form the material is given. The efficient cause, the designer who gives form to the material. 
and the labor that goes into it. And the final cause, of course, is the overall objective of the building itself. And throughout this presentation, I've been uh, talking about this final cause, really. The, the final cause, ultimately, of architecture is that it is a space, uh, it is a dwelling that allows us to uh, repose in tranquility in the presence of Allah SWT. Ultimately, yes, architecture has other objectives. People may build a house because they need shelter. People may build a mosque to worship. People may build an office building for office, offices. But ultimately, underpinning all these secondary reasons why we do build things, ultimately, the whole purpose of dwelling on this earth, the whole purpose of dwelling in dwellings, in buildings, is that it is, the, or the final cause of it all, really, ultimately, is that it provides us with this link and this connection to the luminous ground. So I have already covered this final cause in this presentation, inshallah. In the next few weeks, what I want to do is go back in detail now and discuss the materiality of buildings. So next week, I'll talk about material. I won't talk about anything else but the material and how the very material and materiality of buildings connect us to the luminous ground and how we can recover the sacred art of building towns and villages and buildings and works of art that connect us to Allah SWT. Then in the second week, or the third week, sorry, I'll be talking about the form, the material is given. And we're talking about here about spaces, about arches, about domes, the various types of forms that the material takes. And then what are the types of, what are the qualities required of the designer in order to produce this kind of sacred architecture or this produce this quality of, uh, of life in, in, in man-made uh, buildings, inshallah. So that's the formal end of the presentation, inshallah. Uh, I will be going to Q&A now. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop sharing, inshallah, and see if we have any, uh, any questions on the other end of the line, inshallah. Are there any questions in the chat box uh, or um, any questions, live questions? We don't seem to have any questions uh, so far, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions on YouTube, perhaps? No. Okay, then we'll just leave it at that, inshallah. And uh, we'll resume, uh, inshallah, uh, God willing, uh, next week. I do apologize for my <clears throat> my cold. And I do ap apologize once again for starting late for the technical issues. Uh, but we will be seeing you, inshallah, uh, next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.